Welcome to Manufacturing Talk Radio. Good morning again, all. This is Lou Weiss, and we are in Detroit, Michigan, at the Motion and Power uh, Technology Expo. It's a long name. Mm -hmm. It used to be the Gear Technology Expo, uh, but it's one and the same. It's all uh, uh, managed by the American Gear Manufacturing Association, and I'm happy to be here today with Joe Gopi, who is the Director uh, of Manufacturing at Sumitomo Drive Technology. Welcome aboard. Thank you, Lou. Uh, Sumitomo, that's the big Sumitomo. Yes, so we're part of a very large global organization. I, I, I like to tell people that we are one very, very tiny piece of uh, a big family. So. How big is Sumitomo nowadays? Oof. Uh, so they have a very long history, very, yes. very um, big company it used to be. And, and then I think um, somewhere along the lines, they, they were divided into different divisions. Um, our particular division, we belong to a group called Power Transmissions. Um, I think now that's been renamed as uh, Mechatronics. We belong to another group called Sumitomo Heavy Industries, and they make everything from, you know, little gearboxes all the way to uh, cryogenics and uh, shipbuilding. They have their hands in many, many different so things. So we're talking about billions. Oh, yeah, easily, yeah. No doubt about that. Yeah, I know that Sumitomo Heavy Industries, SHI, uh, has, like, employees in the tens of thousands oh, globally. Yeah. Well, we're honored to have you here. Thank you very much. Okay, so tell me, tell me about Sumitomo Drive Technologies. You've been with them uh, uh, something like 17 years. Yes, sir. Yep. Um, I'm sure you didn't start out as the director of manufacturing. <laughs> That's correct, yeah. So tell us about what you're doing, where you are, how you got there. Okay, yeah. It's, um, so I, I grew up in India, and I did my uh, bachelor's in mechanical engineering there. And after undergrad, I kind of realized that, um, you know, I, I would like to spend uh, my uh, time working with people more. Um, so I kind of drifted into industrial engineering, um, came here, uh, attended Virginia Tech, did my master's there in industrial systems. And then I was uh, basically looking for a job at that time. After that, I uh, did a couple of internships and by chance got connected to Sumitomo. And I did not know anything about Sumitomo at that time. Um, and I joined them as a production engineer on the assembly floor, which was almost, if I had, I could put my finger on something and say, yeah, this is exactly what yes. I should be doing. Didn't quite realize at that time, but yes. it turned out to be a place where you're looking at human machine interactions and you know, you're trying to make the work safer, faster, more efficient, you know, so so it just that's where I started. So you're from uh, Chesapeake, Virginia. I am not from Chesapeake. Uh, these days, I live in a little tiny place called Suffolk, Virginia, which is close to Chesapeake. Right, right. Yep. I'm from Silver Spring, Maryland. I don't know if you know that. It's right outside of Washington. I've heard the DC. name. Cannot place it on the map. I'm sorry. Grew up there, came to New York, and became a New Yorker. Gotcha. So, so do you identify yourself more with Maryland or New York these days? Uh, no, I'm a New Yorker. Okay. And I'm from the home the home of all the criminals in Washington, D.C. <laughs> so I was only kidding, folks. Only kidding. That was just a joke of mine. <laughs> okay. So tell us uh, a little bit about the... You're the championing, championing of the lean manufacturing that goes on with Sumitomo. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, I, my start was in, in um, uh, production engineering, industrial engineering, whatever term you want to use for that, uh, supporting the assembly lines. And again, you're, you're looking at how to make the product flow correctly, uh, better, faster, more efficiently. And th that's sort of where you know, uh, lean manufacturing started right. um, back in, um, I mean, people trace it to like different things. Some some books say it's really Ford 
coming up with that and some people say well you know Toyota and people like that had a big hand in that so there's still a lot of debate going on in yeah. spaces like LinkedIn over that so anyway the the, the point is um, you're looking at how to make work more efficient right and 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 that was sort of what you do how, yeah. how do I make the product uh, without stops without having to turn turn it back right so less defects um, less wasted motion so you're basically tracking waste right so and higher profitability ultimately that's where it all shows up right correct and and I wish I would also say higher customer satisfaction because without that the profitability right. will not be happening so over the last five six years uh, all the new technologies everything from AI which is probably the most recent uh, to 3D printing, mm. uh, robotics, mm -hmm. uh, and all the rest. What do you, uh, and I'm sure that Sumitomo is using all and maybe even working on some of their own. Uh, is that a possibility or is that something you can't talk about? <laughs> <laughs> it's not only a possibility, actually, those are things that are fundamental to what we do uh, uh, in manufacturing engineering. You know, so, so I have a little different take on AI. Today, I think we think of AI as like chat GPT and its clones, I guess, which I think it, it's making its mark. But um, when you think of artificial intelligence, I mean, back in the World War, when they were sending messages and they were coding it, and, you know, all the, the what's the term, Crypt crypto work that was yeah. going into that, cryptography, yeah. right? Then that's the sort of artificial intelligence. You had the machines that were converting it, and right. then they were trying to break it, right, in Britain. All of that had to do with a lot of artificial intelligence. Well, that so, all started in the Second World War. That's right. With, that's right. Uh, I forgot his first name, but Turin. Yep. And uh, he was the originator of that. And it's come a long way. Right. Uh, there are people who are afraid of it as a result of what happens if AI can start making judgments. Mm. Not just decisions, but right. judgments. Right. And that that's a scary thing when you think about it. Right. And I am not good enough to, to, to speak about that at a scholarly level, but uh, uh, to, to answer your question, we do use robotics as necessary. So it's all a question of fit you know mm -hmm. so when you're doing high mix low volume or when you have very large parts some bigger than the size of this booth these are all things that we do yes. in those cases we we tend to kind of stay away from it because it probably takes more time to teach a robot where to go pick up the part right. Right. and you know a skilled machinist by that time could have done it right yes. But when there are the right applications, like you have a more repeatable part or, you know, you have a, um, a low variety, high volume situation, I mean, those are perfect examples of uh, uh, robotics. So if you come to our Chesapeake factory as an example, we have a bevel gear cell and in, in there you, you will see a robot. Why? Because the grinding application is about three minutes and it was boring the heck out of the guy's mind. Yeah. Just loading and unloading parts. And that's when we said, no, we need to make better use of that human talent. Right. Put put a robot in. Fanic and our partners at Weldon did a great job integrating that. And then we took the person out and he's training on something that can be done only by a skilled machinist. And naturally, robotics improves productivity. Correct. Which goes directly to the bottom line. Correct. So, before we sat down to speak uh, just now, we were talking about educating and coaching uh, people yes, sir. and uh, students who come from high school and college. And yep. Let's, uh, let's address that. Sure. So, again, speaking from my um, personal experience, um, we started to feel the the pinch of retirement um, of an entire generation of skilled uh, right. labor you know these are people like um, machinists and engineers and I mean even down to like you know HR accounting yes. you know the, the, those positions don't just uh, people don't get trained on them overnight 
Right. You know, just like you said, you know, I didn't start as director. I started as an engineer, and there right. was a progression there. There was a lot of coaching and mentoring that I received to get to that Surely. point over many, many years. Even now, I'm still learning, right? So, so we saw that as these people are retiring, you know, and they rightfully earned that retirement, that period of rest, you know, how do we, how do we backfill that, right? And uh, how do we prepare the next generation for it? So we, we, we saw that definitely in certain areas, the, the, that pinch was felt much harder, like machining, precision machining. Of course. And uh, so we, we uh, the, the, the team, the executive team in, in the company at that time, they, they were very forward thinking in, in recognizing that and setting up some initial partnerships in the area. To, to, to address that with some local colleges. And later, when I became part of that, that discussion, we partnered with a, a, a local school, a community college called the College of the Albemarle. By the way, shout out to those guys. They are phenomenal. And uh, they help us to understand you know, what needs to be done, both from the educator level and also from the industry level. And as I was mentioning to you before, it is a two-way street. The yeah. industry has to really actively partner with the educators and, you know, help them tell the whole story. So we, we connected with several of the high schools in, in the area that the COA was serving. And uh, we, we gave plan tours, uh, many, many, many plan tours. Yeah, if if there was good. a single parent who said, hey, before I send my son to your place or to this program, I want to see the place. Absolutely, sir bring them anytime right so so a lot of those connections were made and the college grew in their uh, intake of students that benefited not only us but also the entire manufacturing community in that area so so very very nice progression in that and uh, it was really good to see today you know in, in for us to be in a place to where we can draw from that that pool of talent uh, I think it's uh, quite important that the parents uh, buy into it. Absolutely. Uh, it, it's, it's more beneficial. It's more economically suitable. It's not dark, dirty, and dangerous. Yep. And you're not left with a two, $300,000 debt. That's right. And Johnny may have only graduated or 60% of the Johnnies don't graduate. Yeah. So... Um, and kids coming out of school, they're earn, well, a newbie coming yep. to Sumitomo. Yep. How much do they make coming into a job, a manufacturing job? So, so uh, are you asking for an exact dollar figure? Uh, just a range. Okay. So, typically how it, that scheme works is, so the College of Albemarle has a machining program, right? So, they'll train them f uh, for a period of about 18 months. But when they come to us, if they're coming through a program like that, it doesn't need to be that particular institution. Right. Right. But if they're coming to us with machining um, a diploma or something like that under their belt, we immediately award them with two years of experience. So, they start, at a, start out as machinist apprentice but the path from there to a machinist level one, level two, level three is much faster. Sure. We have also taken people who said, hey, you know, I used to work in Wendy's. Yeah. Tired of that. I really want to I'll enjoy working with my hands. I want to get into manufacturing. We've had taken people from there, too. But, you know, the, the kids who go through the machining program definitely get an advantage there. Yeah. And yeah. when they come in. I haven't looked at the, the rates recently, but I want to say it's close to like starting is like $23 or something like that per hour. And and as they grow, grow up, uh, the the uh, rates are automatically increasing, level one, level two, level so three, that, like that. That's, that's on a par of 50000 with benefits oh, yeah. and yeah. Uh, things of that nature. A absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And Sumitomo has some of the best benefits in, in our um, area and the industry. If they so. don't, who should? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. So we have had people join us just for the benefit. So I could tell you that that's, that's actually very good. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So uh, you work, uh, you're working with companies and you're doing coaching. Yes. Through 
these third parties? Actually, we tend to do it a little different. So uh, a few of us, when you get some gray in your beard, right? So we, we look at, hey, listen, you know, this is great. It's been a great journey, but how do we give back and how do we train up the next generation, right? And, and that's important for us. Um, for the company to continue to be successful. And then again, you know, if you have like, you know, only one or two people working on continuous improvement, they can be in so, only so many places in the right. day, right? right? So the real fruit of that comes from multiplying that talent, right? From multiplying that knowledge. So we developed something in-house, you know, we haven't really given it a name per se, but you know, I, I think if you say like, you know, Lean Six Sigma White Belt Training. I think that's sort of what we are going mm -hmm. by. But that was developed to specifically help everybody in a workflow. So not just the leader, not just the engineer, not just two random people, but the entire team has to understand the basics of improvement, right? right. Problem solving, right. right? The The value of quality, you know. And we teach them a little bit of you know, lean manufacturing, a little bit of, you know, the Six Sigma principles, not, excuse me, not a lot of math, but, you know, what's the, what's the thinking here? Mm -hmm. So once mm -hmm. they understand that, then you have a lot of people, actually all the people in the cell or the flow, right, understanding this is our value stream, this is how, you know, we can improve speed and efficiency and safety and all that, right? So now you have much more opportunities being unearthed every day. So about opportunities, and uh, I think we have a clear picture of where you're, where you're getting people and so on. Um, and I'm a big fan of having women in manufacturing. Where does Sumitomo stand with that? How about I tell you that if you look through my LinkedIn page, which is where I usually, you know, either brag about our teams or, you know, ask for help from a professional network. Right. I think the, the last two pictures that I put there are like big steel fabricated housings. And both of them were welded by our, um, our, our senior welders who are, who, are, who are ladies. So we found out that, you know, that they have always been interested in learning and growing the the two ladies that i'm referring to in particular and they're an integral part of the team now and those are some of our key products so i don't think we we think of it anymore as a special thing you know right. um there's i think maybe uh, many years back there was that because again it goes back to the you know uh, the idea that somehow got developed of um manufacturing is this dark dungeon right right and now that we're not that and that stigma has gone it doesn't really matter men women you know it doesn't right. really matter that much it's and, all about skill and application and and women uh, naturally have a tendency to be more creative in yes. many ways and meticulous and meticulous yep right so that's uh, that's a good thing oh yeah yeah uh, Joe, I appreciate your stepping into uh, our podcast studio this morning. Uh, I appreciate uh, your being here. You've given us great insight into uh, Sumitomo and what's happening in your end of the manufacturing world, which is a big part. Uh, and I, I appreciate that very much. Lou, thank you Joe, for having me. It's been an honor. Thank you very and much. And if you happen to be around the Chesapeake area, please come visit us. We have a beautiful story to tell, I believe. You know, I've, I've shared only a little sliver of it. Yep. And I'm not, a, uh, I'm, I'm not the best person to speak about it. There are many people that can show you around and, and really can help you understand our, our journey so I, I thank you for the offer absolutely thank you thank you, thank you for thank having you me. all that's our show for today thanks for listening if you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show please like and subscribe share on social media or leave a review you can find us on youtube spotify apple podcasts google play rumble or your favorite podcast app visit us online at mfgtalkradio.com for our other episodes we have also included links to our advertisers below. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week.